right, today on the episode, we have uh, Joe Connolly, head coach of football sports performance at Arizona State University, the Sun Devils. Coach Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. No, excited to be on here. Yeah, excited to uh, dig into this a little bit. Um, before we kind of get into, you know, developing programming for from a coach perspective on, you know, dealing with a lot of athletes, I guess it's probably 60 plus on a football team. I'm not sure how many a uh, university has. 120. One, wow. Uh, I was thinking about the NFL, but 120. Uh, that's a lot of people to get prepared for and be able to adjust. But before we dig into that, maybe just a little bit of background on you and kind of, you know, your experience in sports and how you got to this point um, as a coach. Sure. No. Um, again, uh, you know, thanks for having me on here. Um, a little bit about me, you know, I've, I've, I'll work, uh, I'll work from past to present, uh, just kind of on this. Um, so I played, uh, I played baseball in college, uh, division one baseball, university of Hartford, um, was probably a lot better at the, the lifting piece of, of training and, and, and as opposed to the sport, um, I kind of figured that out after a few years. Uh, but I love, I was always passionate about training, lifting, running, recovery, um, nutrition, all those things. And uh, I guess it just took me a while to kind of figure out that that could be a career path. You know, I'm, I'm 38, um, about to be 38 here in a, in a week. Uh, but the, uh, the original career path wasn't that. My undergrad degree was in criminal justice and, and, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do after I, I graduated. I messed around and played in some semi-professional baseball leagues. I, uh, I kept training. I, I became a firefighter, uh, an EMT. I sold life insurance for New York Life. <laughs> I managed a landscape company. Um, and none of those things were really um, – None of those things really hit home with me yeah. as far as what I was passionate about in life. So I kind of had an epiphany one day. Uh, I talked to my old strength coach, Emil Johnson, who was the head strength coach uh, at Hartford and then at Yale you know, you know, you, you, University for a few, uh, few years. Um, and I figured it, I could do this. So I went back to school. I got my master's uh, at Bridgewater State uh, University. Um, I lifted on the Olympic weightlifting team there. I got my master's in strength and conditioning. It was a, it was a phys ed degree uh, with a strength and conditioning concentration. And Dr. Ellen Robinson was my department head there um, and, and my mentor and my coach on the weightlifting team, um, which was a great experience. That was a two-year experience. Uh, I went to, as part of that experience, we had to do site visits and internships. Um, and I did a bunch around New England, um, and I went to Harvard. Uh, and when I went to Harvard, one of my best friends in the world, Craig Fitzgerald, was the head strength coach there. Um, he offered me a job as an intern. I took it. I commuted there and back. It was about an hour and ten minutes each day, uh, both hour and ten, an hour and ten home. Uh, I commuted to Bridgewater, which was about an hour and an hour. So I was doing a lot of driving, um, yeah. but. I was an intern. Then once I graduated and received my master's degree, I became a volunteer assistant. And then they, they started uh, paying me a little bit, which was, which was great. It was kind of supplementing the gas income. So I was a, a full-time assistant. Okay. Um, from there, I was there for about a year and a half, two years. Uh, from there, I got an opportunity to uh, work at University of Louisville um, with the football program there. At Harvard, we had 42 sports, so we trained them all. Uh, 42 varsity sports and we had three strength coaches. So we were busy. Um, yeah, I'm sure at Louisville of... at Louisville it was football only. So it was a complete, complete change for me. We kind of got to dive into that and micromanage that. And I worked for Joe Ken, um, you know, who's a, a legendary strength coach in this game. And I was at Louisville for a year. Um, and then Craig Fitzgerald, who was at Harvard, got the job at South Carolina, the head job. And he called me up and asked me to come down there with him to, to, to be the, you know, the assistant there, the assistant director. And I did that. Um, so I moved straight down. Uh, 
I was there at South Carolina for seven years. Fitz was there for three of those, the first three. Then he went to Penn State, and I took over as the director at South Carolina. I was there for four years as the director uh, with Steve Spurrier. Um, Steve Spurrier uh, retired uh, in 2015, um, and at that point, I uh, didn't have a job. Um, I took a job at University of Massachusetts, um, kind of going back home. Uh, it's in Western Mass versus Eastern Mass, which if you're from Massachusetts, you know there's a big difference. Uh, but it was great to be home. Uh, it was great to kind of get back to basics. Um, spent two years there as assistant athletic director for sports performance. We were in charge of everything, um, all, all sports, 26 sports. Um, and then, you know, to now, uh, this will be my third season at Arizona State. Um, I'm just in charge of football here uh, and uh, work for Herm Edwards. So it's, it's been a uh, – that, that, I mean, I could – we could do a whole podcast on that journey and all the intricacies of that journey and all yeah, the I'm funny sure. stories and different teams and athletes, but uh, that's kind of it in a nutshell. That's uh... – pretty phenomenal uh development over the uh, kind of a short time really you said you're 38 and um being surrounded by you know some of the top folks in the game uh, from a strength perspective and it seems like even your personal experience um doing the weightlifting what did what were you able to pull out of that as as you developed like doing it physically and then learning i guess the science a little bit behind that um as you developed your own coaching methods and and things of that nature? Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, I think that all the things I learned in graduate school, they're still foundational in my philosophy now. Um, So being an athlete, you weren't exposed to the intricacies of technique, uh, the classic lifts, you know, typically – when I was playing, our, our program was a hand clean front squat. It was, it was a little bit uh, Mike Boyle-esque, um, kind of, you know, the 2000, early 2000s, that was, that was what a lot of people in New England were doing. And it's a great program. Um, when I got to Bridgewater, I got exposed to the classics. So I got exposed to the clean jerk, the snatch, all the variations of those. And literally learned by doing – uh, from a technical perspective. So um, m- both on a personal level myself, and then one of our classes, w- it was really cool. We, we took the general population of, of the student body and we taught them the clean and jerk, the snatch. Um, we taught them bench, squat, deadlift, uh, all the auxiliary movements to, to the general population that had never done it before. Yeah, so and basically, like brand new, brand new. Whether they were good at, they, like some of them were athletes. And Bridgewater was a Division three program, um, and, and so there was there was some, you know, higher caliber athletes. But sure. a lot a lot of them were just athletes. They were doing it because they loved it, right? Yeah. They're not they're not you know thinking they're going to go to the NFL or to the NBA or whatever. Not saying that that didn't happen, but. I got exposed. Yeah, I got exposed to the whole gamut of, you know, we had gymnasts in there that, or ballerinas. I remember, I remember teaching a ballerina had a deadlift. I, 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 I'm never, <laughs> and regardless of the load or the intensity, you learned how to, in the moment, get the athlete to move the way you wanted them to, um, and make the lift look the way you know it's supposed to look. Right. So I still reference that to this day, you know, 15 years later that I, that experience to me was, you know, when I'm talking to my interns, I'm like, listen, this is learning how to coach in the moment on the floor. That's where, that's where you really get, you make some hay in this, in this profession because that's what you do. Yeah. You know, you can have a great, like we were talking about before you started, you can have a great plan. You can have a great, card or workout or progression or macro meso micro cycle but if what you see isn't 
jiving with what's on that card, you better be able to deviate from that and make some changes. So all those experiences, they, they, they make up who I am today. Yeah. Sure. So you can kind of take that, the head knowledge and then uh, call it the head and the heart, right? You take the head knowledge and you take it to the practical application and adjust based on where the person is, not where the ideal state, I guess, or that's where you want to get them to. Right. Yeah. I mean, I always say that, you know, one of the quotes I always use with our, with our, with my assistants and the interns is the athlete dictates the program. And what I mean by that is not that the athlete comes in and says, Hey, I want to squat today. That's not what I mean. What I mean is what the athlete needs dictates the program. Um, and that changes constantly. So I'm not going to train an 18 year old the same way I'm going to train a 22 or 23 year old. I'm not going to train all 18 year olds the same either. And why is that? Is that because, well, number one, training age. Uh, number two, when they get here, they're all from different backgrounds. So you have to incorporate some variability into your program that'll allow you to give the athlete what they need at a given time. Um, to me, that's the easiest way to get improvement, to get adaptation over a long term. You know, I like the term minimum effective dose uh, from a programming perspective. Um, but ultimately, I see it too many times, and I've been guilty of it in my career, force-feeding athletes something that they may not need at a given time. Yeah. Um, you know, or whatever that is. It, it can be anything, you know. But um, you got to know what you want to get out of the situation, and then you got to know how to get it. I think so that's – the, the Kind of the objective, like knowing your objective, what's the goal of the either the workout or the even that the macro, the overall – fitness desired outcome, I guess, for football, you know, different strength or, or explosiveness yeah. to, um, you know, speed and durability. Yeah. I mean, we use the term physiological adaptation. So whatever, whatever physiological adaptation we're trying to elicit, we got to figure out the best way to elicit that response. You know, for example, hypertrophy can be done, a lot of different ways. We know that now. We you can you can get bigger muscles with sets of five. You can get bigger muscles with sets of fifteen. You can get bigger muscles with time under tension. You can get bigger muscles through, you know, blood flow. So there's there's a lot of different ways to do it. And having that idea and that that kind of global thought process before we program as a staff, I think is important. Yeah. Know? Kind of taking the macro and the micro all at once and that kind of, I don't want to say dichotomy, but that's probably the best term for it. Um, so when, when you look at doing these workouts, I mean, are you looking at form and function first over anything else? Yeah. I mean, I'm a, you know, we talked a little bit about some of my experiences from a technique perspective. I'm, I'm, when it comes to the movements that we want to foster, uh, from just a sheer movement perspective, I, I'm a I'm pretty hard on the guys to move the way we want them to move, um, to get the most out of the lifts we're going to end up using. Um, and again, you know, we'll use an overhead press for example. Everyone's different. A lot of people are scared of overhead press because athletes with different lever arms and different biomechanics don't all look the same. But good technique is a range, um, in my opinion. It's like they talk about neutral spine as a range. It, it really is. Right. Um, there is no perf perfect movement, but – we got to get as close to it as we possibly can um, in a safe and healthy manner uh, and using different things along the way to get a guy with a longer arm and a shorter torso and a tight T-spine and, a, <laughs> you know, all those different things up and down the chain to get them in a good position. We, we try to use all those different tools in our toolbox to kind of get the movement to be, 
pure and crisp and, and quality uh, before we kind of load that movement. Okay. Yeah. No, From makes a sense. developmental perspective, when you're talking about the course of a, you know, a three to five year career. Right. Yeah. Um, no, it makes sense, especially uh, it, those are some serious details that you don't always take into consideration is, is the simple fact that we're all a little physically different and it doesn't necessarily mean wrong. It's just adjust or adapt to the, the person to make sure it's, uh, helpful, right? So they're not going to get injured. Yeah. I mean, ultimately that's, that's our goal. We're, we're, a lot of a lot of strength coaches lose sight of what we're here to do. We're not here to 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 create Olympic lifters. We're not here to create power lifters. We're not here to create bodybuilders. We're here to develop hypertrophy, strength, and power, and all the variations of each one of those adaptations, so that the sport coach can develop the specific attributes of the sport better okay we're, we my belief is we are general and the sport coach is specific and there is some carry over there um in particular as we get closer to sport but 95 percent of what we do is general we're putting a better suspension on the car we are creating a bigger engine on the car we're increasing this, the strength and the integrity of the frame of the car, better tires. Um, we're not teaching them how to drive quite often, but we're, we're developing the robust, you know, durable athlete. Athlete. That's, that's our job. You know? So, and when you say that, is that applicable? You're saying general, that could be regardless of sport, like that earlier example with the ballerina to you know, a football player, what you're doing is 90 to 95% attributable to anybody who's looking to be physically fit. And then, yeah, I, no, I, and, and, you know, yes, you train a lot of different sports differently. Um, you know, I've, I've trained a lot of sports in my career and the programs look vastly different, but the goals are the same. Um, you can have specificity in a golf program 100%. You're going to talk a little bit more about rotation and anti-rotation and, and um, symmetry in the hips and shoulders and maybe a little bit more mobility in certain spots because you've evaluated the sport and the requirements of it. But to me, the goals are still mostly the same. It's to develop a little bit more strength, a little bit more – power a little bit more uh tendon ligament strength or wh whatever it is yeah um, it's all part of the piece of the pie you know and, and um you can do that in a lot of different ways uh but ultimately it's not much different than training football or training a ballerina it's really not yeah so do you run into uh is that an element of the coaching aspect of trying to dispel that mindset meaning kind of like I, I grew up as a runner, right? So historically, back when I grew up in the 90s, there was virtually nothing then. But now I'm seeing a big shift. Uh, and depending on who you talk to, um, a lot more strength. But you're not necessarily trying to throw up heavy weight. Um, anyway, that being said, you know, are you seeing any um, – or do you, have you run into those kinds of issues where you're trying to dispel preconceived notions? Yeah, I mean, that's always going to be the case. Um, I think that football is a little bit um, a little bit further along and that the coaches kind of understand that certain things are required during certain times, right? Um, and that the nature of our schedule allows us to put a priority on training strength training. We train 90%, 95% of the time. We play 12, 13, 14 times a year. That's it. Um, I think the sports that, you know, in particular sport, I played baseball. We played 56 games from February to May. 
and then I'd play another 50 games from June, July, and then we'd have a fall season. So we're constantly playing the sport. Yeah. So um, there wasn't as much time. But, I, you know, for example, like when I was doing my graduate program, Dr. Robinson, she's an amazing woman. She, she's been a world-class she was, she's, she's been a world-class in everything she's done. She was a world-class swimmer. She was a world-class bodybuilder, a world-class power lifter. Then she decided to run marathons. She was a world-class distance runner. And now she's in a world, world-class Olympic weightlifter. And one of the things she always taught me was the importance of strength training, regardless yeah. of sport. You know, I mean, your background is distance. You're going to have a better finish to your race if you have incorporated some sort of strength training into your programming. It doesn't have to be 90% of the pie, but if you start incorporating 10 or 20% of that pie into strength training, you're going to see the results. Yeah. You're going to have better results. So, and, and now – over the course of time, our research and development has, has kind of backed that up. You know, what, what we knew, you know, early on, based on just bro science, if you want to call it that, it's getting backed up with science. So, yeah, um, yeah I mean, it's – education is always first. That's like when I'm talking to a sport coach and I, I know what I want to get done – it's my job to show that sport coach, if they don't agree with me, why they should agree with me <laughs> and, or, or have a conversation. Yeah. You know, that, that's our job as sport coaches. And ultimately, I think the, the dichotomy is changing a little bit. I think in collegiate, in particular in the past, the sport coach has always had kind of the last say uh, in what's important and what's not. And I think it's becoming more of a partnership now, yeah. um, more of a, a collaborative you know, effort, maybe. Yeah. A collaborative. People use the term high performance model. Um, that's come, that's a little bit more trendy nowadays where your sport coach, your sports performance coach, your sports science, your athletic trainer, your physio is all, in, in one, we all have the same goals and the same priorities, but a lot of times in the past we fought with each other over everything. And now we're working together, I think a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, I think that's the way it's moving. I hope. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can apply that in just about any aspect from a, either a physical fitness or leadership. You know, you guys are coaches, so you're leading young men and, and football and, and, that can really apply to a variety of dynamics of being able to collaborate and just either agree to disagree or at least understand context as to what and why behind the intent. And, and like you said, everybody's kind of rowing in the same objective is just making sure you're addressing kind of a well-rounded approach to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You know, I think you, you just said it and I literally have notes right here that cause I, I was kind of just going through it, but like, understanding the why is like to me the most important thing for um unity on a team as far as everyone's bought in everybody's moving in the same direction regardless of whether you're talking about programming rehab leadership goals whether that's my staff whether that's you know the athletic trainers and us together or or the the, the athletes on the team um you know, I always try to start with the why so that everybody understands the reason behind what we're doing. Yeah. And that creates buy-in. Yeah, absolutely. And <laughs> recently, a kind of funny anecdote is you can even apply it to parenting if you have kids, but I've got three, but you know, sometimes, you know, there's a reason you need to say, just do it. And then there's times where you have to articulate why so that they'll do it to the best of their ability. Right. No, it makes sense. I mean, it's, you know, I think it's, I think it holds true in all aspects of life, whether it's business, um, any organization, whether that's a family organization or a, or a sport organization or a business organization, the why I think is like, like number one. So um, 
kind of went into the, the leadership element of it. So you're coaching a uh, football program. Many of these kids are coming from, you know, they're in an interesting transition point in their lives. Um, they're in a tier one program. So there's a lot of weight to it, but also they're uh, venturing out. Most of these kids probably weren't living on their own. Are you going to deal with a continuum of experience, right? Where they come from um, throughout the U S or what have you, how do you handle the mental aspect um, or is that involved in the aspect of what you're dealing? Because, you know, for other guests and my own personal experiences, the mental is critical to being able to do the physical. So how do you handle some of those things in those transition moments? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we, as, as sports performance coaches, we wear like a lot of different hats. Um, and that's, that's part of the reason why I really like the profession that, that I'm in is like, I have to be, I have to be a disciplinarian. I have to be, uh, I have to be a mentor. I have to be an educator or a teacher. I have to be uh, a psychiatrist. Um, I have to be, uh, I have to be a lot of different things because to me, the relationship and the, and the, the interaction between athlete and coach is, is more important than the sets and reps, the, the programming, the, the things that when I came out of school, I thought was important. Right. I thought all this stuff is, is the priority and, and it's not, um, it's important, but it's not the priority. Uh, so when athletes get in here, we got nothing but unknowns. And a lot of times we have to kind of de-recruit them. Uh, that term is, you know, uh, regardless of how you look at it, they've been told by whoever, for whatever reason, whatever they want to hear, usually for a while. Right. Uh, and when they get here, it's not that way. Uh, it might be a little different than – the two things I ask are – it's two traits, and it's intensity and consistency. And honestly, I think that early on, the consistency is the most important thing. Um, we don't have a lot of rules within our program. Uh, we have two rules. We have, you have to be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. So you have to be on time and your words and your actions have to match up. That those are two of coach Edwards philosophies. And I, I couldn't agree with them more. And I think that if you start to put too many things, especially on like a 18 year old's plate, that's in college for the first time, yeah, you're not going to really make any gains with anything. Cause you're just going to make a little improvement in a lot of different things versus starting with the priorities, making some improvements and then building upon that. Um, so those are, those are the things we hammer home early on, you know, be on time, uh, you know, and, and Hey, a coach, I want to be all Pac-12. Okay, that's great. I want you to be all Pac-12 too. Here's what you got to do in order to do that first. Yeah. And and teaching those lessons over the course of a career. Um, you know, our seniors are, are still learning. I think that's important. You know, we're still trying to teach advanced leadership to that group versus the 18 and 19-year-old freshmen are learning, hey, man, I got to be in the weight room on time. Yeah. I have to lead yourself uh, first. Yeah. I have to be in the training room on time. If I say I can be at this place at a specific time, I'm going to be there on time. So it, I think simple to advanced. It's just like programming. You work simple to advanced. You work simple to advanced in leadership and, 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 and learning. It's periodization of life. Yeah. Uh, you know, is really what it is. Now, that's a great, great way to put it is the periodization of life and just kind of, know where you are. And if, you know, like you said, around all pack 12, right. That's your vision. That's awesome. Put it out there, but you have to reverse engineer down to today and the next two hours that I've got you in the gym, how that, that micro movement goes to that pack 12 back to your comment on the why. 
or, or the specific rep you're doing at the very second you're doing it, you know, right. like you have to break it because when you talk to a freshman, an 18 year old that just walked in here and you're like, Hey man, we got eight weeks to train. They're like, Whoa, eight weeks. Huh? I got trained four days a week, two hours of those four days for eight weeks. Don't think about that because you're going to get overwhelmed, right? right? You think about this moment, this exercise, this rep, doing it the very best you can. And then, building on that and all those little battles equal a victory eventually it's yep you know and and, th and those those lessons don't change on saturday in the fall right it's this play and then the next play and then the next play and hopefully all those successful plays or or not successful plays add up to a, a, a victory yeah you know um one brick at a time yeah yeah. And however, whatever cliche term you use, I've heard brick by brick. I've heard, yeah. you know, you know, mortar and I've heard all these different, you know, that that's great. Like as long as it's understood that this, this moment is, is the most important moment. And then the next one and then the next one. Yeah. And just build off of it. Yep. Um, so from a, a dovetail into one aspect of it, how do you uh, incorporate, you know, this is the rest from recovery podcast. So um, recovery into this. So whether it be active or I don't know if there's any modalities you guys use at the football, I, historically I've always seen the ice bath, but are there other things that you as a coach look at or have you investigated different things uh, related to that for helping with recovery? Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I think I've tried personally just about every recovery, restoration, restorative modality there is <laughs> because I, I, I still train and I still try to, you know, we talked about like a lot of times I'm doing the program the players are doing because I want to feel what it feels like, but I'm not 22 anymore. <laughs> so um, I learn what works for me. Um, I will, I learn what I like. I learn what's a placebo and what's not. And then what I do and my staff does is we educate our players. Um, we do what's called warm up wisdoms. Uh, it, it happens a lot during the season. We take about five minutes on a specific topic and we educate them on that topic. It might be uh, the truth about creatine take five minutes and be like, listen, here's the facts. We do a little PowerPoint. Here's the facts, fellas. This is what we know based on the research. This is what it does. This is what it doesn't do. This is what it can do. These are the pros. These are the cons. It's your, it's your decision whether you want to do it or not. Yeah. Right. Uh, recovery. Um, here's what we know about the ice bath. Right. We do a, basically a, a case study on it and we decide all right, let's talk about contrast versus cold immersion, sauna. Let's talk about all these different variables. Um, let's talk about where your, where your ancestors are from and how that affects cold water immersion on some people, right? Because yeah. if you're from the Caribbean, cold water immersion might create more anxiety and stress in you that causes more inflammation. Versus if you're from Alaska, right? right. So we, we have to be able to, to educate our athletes on what works for them. So ultimately, like, we'll break it down. What's the goal of contrast? Well, it's vasodilation, vasoconstriction. Okay, what are the different methods to, to create that response? Well, we can use a Normatec. We can use a hot and cold plunge. We mm -hmm. can use um, uh, blood flow restriction. We can use uh, just general uh, dynamic warm up or, 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 you know, kind of a strength aerobics. We can use a lot of different methods to kind of get that recovery response. And we let our athletes pick which one works best for them. We might require some sort of recovery modality during certain times of year, during certain periods. And we'll monitor all those to make sure they're getting done. 
but again, we, we try to use a, 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 a variability there that allows the athlete to get what they need out of the situation. Yeah. Um, we do do a ton of soft tissue work. Uh, we do do a lot of SMR uh, in conjunction with mobility of that specific area. Um, we do uh, a flush at the end of every workout where, you know, our athletes, we call it legs up. Our athletes go legs up on the wall for three minutes at the end of the workout to, to create that, that flushing of the, of the, of the body that, that we just worked. We do do some static stretching as a form of central nervous system uh, relaxation. Uh, it's not, yeah. you know, our, our flexibility is not creating more flexibility. It's calming us down post-exercise. Um, we do do uh, hot and cold plunges. We have uh, cryo available. Uh, mm. Massage therapy is huge. Um, oxygen therapy. Yep. Uh, it, you guys really cover the gamut. Yeah, I mean, we try. We we we're very fortunate to have the ability to do a lot of those different things. I've had guys do float tanks. I'm a big believer in the in the float tank. I I do it yeah. probably once a month. Um, I think it's great. Uh, more for athletes that are having trouble with sleep that as, a, as a method for recovery than anything. Um, and and there, there it is. There's the granddaddy of them all, sleep. Yep. Right? It's the most important recovery method you can use. Um, and I just recently, you know, I, I, I had some issues with my recovery and my sleep. I just got a CPAP just now at 38 years old and I'm recovering right now like a Wolverine because I'm literally for 37 years been holding my breath at night and I didn't know I was doing it and I got a, a polar watch that and does heart rate variability and I'm like why can't I get this where I want it and I went and saw a sleep specialist and then bam you know I'm I'm, I'm in the green. You know? yeah. it's, it's like, it's, it's the greatest thing in the world. So now as part of our kind of onboarding of athletes, you know, Hey, how's your sleep? That's, that's a, those are questionnaires that are being, being developed and asked of our athletes so that we can kind of get ahead of things. Um, yeah. I guess stereotypically it's probably something you have to address regularly with college kids. Um, burning the candle on both ends, which, you know, all of us are, are guilty of it some way, shape or form. Right. At some point. And you look at like sleep quality over sleep duration. If you get six hours of sleep, you got to maximize those six hours. So sleep hygiene is important. We educate them on that. Cold, dark, and quiet. Just simple stuff. Yep. Um, you look at our offensive linemen. They're 330 pounds with big, thick necks. It might not be their fault that they're not recovering. They might be in bed for seven and a half, eight hours but they're just not recovering the way they need to. So do we need to do a sleep study for somebody like that to help them to get them a CPAP or give them other methods or a mouth guard or whatever it is right? Um, to kind of help them do that. All, all those things are on the table for us. Awesome. Um, well, Joe, I mean, we've been talking for a little while now, so coming up on time, I'm grateful for the, for the time you spent and great information is really um interesting to get your perspective coming from a diverse background in fitness. Um, I usually close things out with a couple of personal questions. Mm -hmm. So what are you reading right now? Uh, I am reading. I, I'm, I'm, I am always guilty of having like more than one book going at the same time. <laughs> yeah. You and me both. Um, and a lot of times it's like you're trying to figure out where you want to read certain things, right? So uh, pre-bed right now I'm reading Helter Skelter, um, which is I think the number one best-selling true crime novel of all time. The reason I'm reading that is because I did I, I listened to that Joe Rogan podcast with I think the guy's name was Tom O'Neill, and he was re like he wrote a book that basically went against everything that was written in Helter Skelter. So I'm going to read Helter Skelter first, and then I'm going to read Tom's book after, because I was just interested in that whole crime, murder, mystery, but it was actually happened. Yeah. 
And I read that before bed because it goes against everything I do in my life so I can fall asleep. Yeah. Um, I just got done reading the Pentagon's brain, which is another book that I, I heard about on the podcast. Uh, Annie Jacobson was the author. It was like 700 pages. It was heavy stuff. It was about DARPA and what, what, where we are in the world with technology and how military technology is, you know, drives a lot of what we do now with cell phones and GPS and yeah. Interesting. Cars Interesting. and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I am also, I, I like audio books a lot cause I feel like I can be more efficient. Yeah. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, I listen to Mark Bell's podcast. I listen to, um, hold on, let me open it just so I'm not talking, uh, nonsense here. Uh, I listen to Greg Knuckles' podcast. I think that's one of the best ones. Um, what does he cover? Okay. Uh, so Greg Knuckles is uh, Stronger by Science. That's fantastic. I listen to um, Ben Greedfield's podcast. I listen to uh, the Muscle Intelligence podcast with um, – uh, Ben, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, P- Poglowski, uh, Joe Rogan, Steve, uh, Jocko Willing, Steve Austin, London Real. Uh, I got into last year, I started, um, I started running. Uh, so a little background, uh, I'm, I've always been an anaerobic athlete my whole life. I've always been a lifter, uh, Olympic lifter, uh, you know, baseball thrower, uh, sprinter. Um, I'm, you know, I've always been a bigger guy, 240 to 270 pounds at any time. Uh, and I read, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, David Goggins. Sorry. I I read David Goggins book. Yeah. Great book. Um, And I just started running last year. Like I, I literally was like, I'm not going to do anything now at 38 in strength that's novel at this point. Like I, I'm, I'm kind of past my prime a little bit. I'm still going to train. I love lifting. Uh, but like the days for me, I think of PRs are kind of over. Yeah. Um, and I was a little bit lost as to like what, what was motivating me to, to, to continue to train. And so I read his book. And I was like, you know what, man, like I need something that's so difficult and challenging for me that it hurts and it's hard. Um, Not necessarily for the physiological piece, but just for the mental piece. Yeah. And so I just started running. Um, I started doing distance running and I'll just, I'll go on the desert and I'll run. Um, And, you know, last year I got, you know, 12, 15 miles. I was doing, I was running four days a week. I was doing a, a, a short distance run, uh, three to four miles. I was doing an interval run where I was doing like repeat miles or, or repeat half miles at a higher intensity. Um, I was doing a middle distance run, like, you know, six miles. And then I was doing a long, slow run, um, you know, somewhere between seven and whatever. And I was trying to learn periodization. So I listened to like, you know, four or five different podcasts. I read a bunch of different books on triathlons and, and the periodization of that. Um, and you know, I just, I, I did a couple races. Um, I didn't buy a bike and I started swimming, but, uh, you know, the, the whole, the, the, the Corona kind of, I had some master plans for this year, but I kind of got put on hold, but yeah, my plan is to try to do a sprint triathlon or something along those lines coming up just because I'm not good at it. It's, it's hard. It's yeah. terrible. I feel, you know, like yeah. I have to, I, I feel like I can strain for five seconds for just about anything. But when that long duration strain, like I have new appreciation for anybody that, that competes in endurance sports at all, because it's, it's grueling and it's, it's like meditation. It's psychologically straining. 
Yeah. And I, and I kind of fell in love with it. Honestly, like I'm, my wife and I go out on Sundays and we go off. There's being, being in Arizona is great. Cause there's so many different things you can do, but we'll just go off on a trail run and, and, you know, we'll run, we will, we'll pack it up. we got our camelbacks and our fanny packs and water and everything. And we'll go out and we'll run, you know, I'll just run six, seven miles away from my car, knowing that I have to run back. <laughs> it's, it's the only way that I can get to that long. Cause I just have those, you know, there's those yeah. teams, the, the good and the bad, you know, cause you, you've yeah. been doing it. Like it's, ah, you could turn back now. It's been enough. It's okay. You know, and, and that battle has been something that um, I've really loved and learned, you know, and it's, it's something that I feel like I had to experience um, just as a, as an athlete, you know, more than and anything else. Um, yeah. that endurance piece. So I know I went off on a tangent there, but uh, no, it's a great one. It's all part of kind of who we are at the moment. You know, if you asked me that four years ago, I said, you're crazy. I'm never going to run. Uh, I'm never going to do that because it, it's, it, you know, physiologically it goes against what I'm trying to do. You know, I'm trying to be this uppity scientist, strength coach, sports coach. Like, oh man, there's more variables to it. It's an art. It's a science. Yeah. Uh, everybody's changing. Everybody's evolving and, and, all those things are important to who we are at the moment. So, yeah. And like you said, you can learn from every perspective yeah. uh, and, and experience and probably apply it going forward into maybe even tweaking a particular workout or something like that for these football players. Cause I mean, at some point, you know, like you said, I'm kind of the opposite of you is similar process, just the other end. Right. right. Uh, and the last, year I've been focusing more on the weightlifting side of things and the functional movements, something I've always avoided because I'm a, I'm a runner. I'm not a strength guy or whatever limiting belief I had. Um, so yeah, I could totally relate to the process, but, um, one of the, anyway. and two, like one, you know, just in the same sense, like one of the things I noticed and this is, and, and I don't know if it goes against science or not, but, a lot of my aches and pains that I had for decades, like I had chronic patella tendonitis for 10 years. It's gone since I started running. And I don't know why. It, my, my, uh, my hip was, you know, bad. I had some issues with my hip. Yeah. A lot of those, and whether it's whether it's the blood flow or the the repetitive motion or the the cyclical um, piece of that, I don't know the answer to why. But all a lot of my inflammation is gone. A lot of my aches and pains are are gone, and that kind of goes against kind of conven conventional wisdom. I thought I was going to get more aches and pains. Yeah. And after kind of the original, the initial adaptation to it, I don't, I squat without, I, I couldn't squat without a, a knee wrap, you know, or, or a sleeve for, for years. I squat without them now. I don't need them. They don't, yeah. it doesn't hurt. So I, I, I can't answer that from a, I'm not sure what the, the mechanism is behind that, but there's, there's some improvement to how I feel. That's all I know. Well, I mean, sometimes that kind of anecdotal piece is all you need. Like you don't necessarily need a book or some uh, physiological thing to affirm how you feel um, from it. You know, I mean, it just, but that'd be an interesting use case or test case to dig into. Um, and I, I just wonder, just thinking aloud, if it has to do with, like we were saying, those limiting beliefs or false expectations around, oh, I just lift or I just, the one side or the other, that there's like this middle ground. That if you are doing a particular strength base like football, you do need some cardio to kind of keep that thing in balance, your body in balance. Yeah. So when I when I program our conditioning for football, there's always an aerobic component to it. And the <clears throat> reason for that is what I've learned 
over the course of time from a recovery perspective. A 300 pound lineman is gonna get aerobic pretty quick. Uh, so I'm not saying we're going out and running miles, but during the early off season after the season is at done in January when we start back up, there's a aerobic component to our training and it's for recovery. Yeah. Um, it's not for, it's not really for the sport in general. It's for the recovery so that we can feel good about where we are moving forward. Um, and it's just a different stressor on your body too. That is beneficial. Yeah. No, you know, I agree. Big guys standing up pretty strong in the fourth quarter. If you're driving down the field and trying to win the game, yep. you want to be able to move the other guy that, pretty well. That robust foundation for, you know, the, the anaerobic piece of the sport. Yeah. Yeah. So we already touched on my second question on uh, podcast, but the other aspect is music. Anything on your rotation right now? I listen to, it depends on what mood I'm in. I listen to everything. Um, I listen to jazz a lot. Uh, I like like Coltrane and just like old school jazz. Um, I listen to that in my car a lot, especially when I'm trying to wind down from a, from a, a, a long day at work. Um, I got like a 15 minute commute. So I listen to that. I'll listen to that when I clean uh, at, at my house, my wife and I clean on Sunday. We, we clean together. Uh, just part of our agreement and jazz is on and, and we're clean. Um, I listen to Metallica, ACDC when I'm lifting. Uh, I listen to techno. I listen to hip hop, rap. Um, I like to, again, it, it kind of goes, I listen to country, uh, you know, I was at South Carolina for seven years. I, you know, played baseball, so country's part of that. Yeah. Um, I like, I kind of like it all. Um, and I think that, like, we have different days where we listen to different things in the weight room for our players. Um, they get to pick certain things depending on the day. Like, when we squat, we, have, we, we call it Big Squat Friday. It's going to be, it's going to be some sort of heavy metal. And our guys kind of, they, they, they cherish it. I had a, I had an athlete who's, who's on the Titans now. Uh, he texted me last Friday and he said, Hey man, I would give anything for one more big squat Friday with, with some <laughs> heavy metal. And he's not a guy that would ever listen to that kind of normally. Um, but I think to me, music has its place depending on what you're doing. You yeah. know, when we're doing our cleans and we want to elicit speed and power, we got some upbeat techno on. You know, and our guys are, are, are feeling that, that beat and their, their nervous system is excited. Um, there's times we might not listen to anything because I don't want to excite them. You know, in season, there's times on Sundays when we're, when we're trying to lift and we don't want to get excited because 24 hours before we were really excited yeah. during a game, I might not put anything on. You know, so um, – Again, I think that all music plays such a huge part in how we feel yep. uh, in different moments. So I like to try to tailor that to, to what, we're, what I'm trying to do and what we're trying to do as a program. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, final question. So what is your go-to rest and recovery? And I think we may have touched on it, but your go-to method. Sleep. Sleep and nutrition and hydration. You know, it's, it's simple. Like – People want to get so advanced in today's day and age because we have so much information. Your body can only respond and adapt to what you give it. And your adaptation is directly correlated to how you eat, sleep, and recover. So if you're in a caloric deficit, you will not recover. If you're not adequately sleeping, you will not recover. If your stress level is too high, you will not recover. So if those things aren't in play, it's like taking creatine for somebody that doesn't eat enough calories. It's not going to help, right? So you have to have your foundation correct and functioning correctly in order to put kind of the cherry on top of each one of those things. I'm not saying creatine's bad. I'm saying you're wasting your money if you're not 
eating enough calories with enough macronutrients to sustain what you're doing. You're not sleeping enough to recover from what you're doing to yourself and your stress level isn't in check. So you're not, you know, practicing mindfulness or, um, you know, doing sauna or whatever it is you need to do to recover. So those are my, those are all kind of simple mind mindful. Like I'll use an app for mindfulness when I, when I'm feeling really stressed out after a long day, my wife knows if I go in the room and close the door and I come back out in 15 minutes, she knows to leave me alone because I needed to take it down before I can kind of have a, and I learned this over the course of years. Like I, I would take, I would take my work home and be, you know, yeah, parasympathetic all day long, you know, and, and be burnt out and, and tired and not sleep enough. And so I try to give all those lessons to, to the athletes that, that we coach um, because it's, it's all part of the puzzle. Um, and however you can get there, you can get there. But if you're not, again, I educate our athletes on what's trendy in the moment, right? Like, you know, social media drives a lot of what they believe yeah. uh, and what they think because it's trendy. Like look at the altitude masks, right? That came out, you know, a few years ago and everybody was wearing them. And then everybody talked about how they didn't work. And now everybody's like, well, there are some positive benefits to them, but they're not what we originally thought they were, right? So originally it was, hey, you're training at altitude. Well, no, you're not. You're, you're creating a filter which causes it to be more difficult to inhale and exhale. Right. Uh, the moment you take that off, is it like training at altitude? No, it's not like that at all. What it does do is it strengthens your diaphragm it strengthens the muscles that are involved in breathing so is there some positive benefits to it yeah there is we we figured that out you know but initially it was hey i'm training at altitude and i'm like no you're not you're not you're not really doing you're not really doing anything you're you're just making it more difficult to breathe so um i i just try to i just try to help that any way I can, you know, with, with, with actual information that's factual, you know? Yeah. Cause there's a lot of, a lot of stuff floating around, like you said, on social media. So, uh, Joe, man, I am super grateful for this conversation and the time and, uh, how can folks find you on the, yeah. So I'm, um, I, I got Twitter. Uh, I think it's ASU coach Joe, uh, Instagram is the same. Uh, Facebook is, is a little bit more, uh, um, it's just Joe Connolly. Um, I, uh, my email is on the, on the website. It's Joe Connolly at ASU.edu. Uh, if anybody ever has any questions or, or, you know, wants to intern or shadow or, or whatever, we'll, um, we're, we're, our, our door's always open. Uh, I'm not, one of those coaches that um, thinks he's doing something that's a secret. Uh, We're, we're, we're just trying to help as best we can um, to, to, for the profession, for the athlete, for um, the coach, uh, whoever. So um, that's, that's where you can find me. I I don't really have, uh, I don't really have an agenda (laughs) other than to, uh, to try to help our athletes get better. It's really awesome. good. All right, coach. Thank you. Much. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, that was great having me. Thank, thank you, man.